This talk is titled Climate Change, the Latest and Some Things Unforeseen. And he will give us some updates about climate change and talk about what is ahead for Vermont, the growing variability of spring, summer heat, and winter cold, and what the land of sea ice has in store for us and our planet. And he'll talk for about an hour and a quarter, and then he will take a few questions. So, thank you for coming. Thanks for coming out on a very snowy night, and uh, um, not very snowy, but I think it's what we're all kind of hoping for eventually, right? So yeah, we might maybe uh, end up with uh, 10 inches on the other side of the weekend. A little th three storms coming in, so uh, that would be nice. I know there's a lot of very depressed skiers and cross-country skiers and snowshoers like myself, and just people who like to have snow, and there's a lot of psychological reflectivity you know, the snowpack, uh, and it just makes things a whole lot better, I think, especially when it's all, when the sun comes out, it's, there's nothing like it. And of course, we cherish snow, so bring it on. Well, my talk is, uh, is going to be um, about uh, some of the things that are new, uh, a little bit of review. Um, I also did a presentation for the Sustainable Montpelier, and um, I'm going to add to some of that and go over some of that stuff too because there's a lot of interesting things going on in climate right now because of the, uh, the way, way it affects weather um, and um, mostly has to do with winter and we're going to get into a little bit of that. I have a lot of slides so I just want to warn you, some of that stuff I'm going to go through pretty quick. Some of it is a little tedious and I want to spend too much time on a few things but other things will slow down and uh, get the important stuff out of the way. So thanks very much for uh, coming in, and uh, we'll proceed. This is my uh, disclaimer and attributes. <laughs> um, there, you can see the papers there, the peer-reviewed papers. Um, these are, um, of course, the researchers and the climate scientists, uh, climatologists, um, various experts in, in different fields. And um, uh, they, they do quite a bit of the work that, of course, we presenters talk about and uh, they're very, very important. Of course, being a climate scientist nowadays is not a real good situation psychologically. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, of a downer, I guess, but um, uh, we need to know more and more and find out some of the feedbacks and what's going on, and that's what we'll be talking about a little bit. So the new normal. Um, so you, know, you see the, the jet stream here, and that's part of what we're looking at, um, some of the changes uh, that are taking place with the uh, jet stream beginning to slow down a little bit uh, and what that is caused by. But we're going to uh, kind of do a little bit of a summary here as I go along. So this next slide here, I want to show you, um, okay, that is the, uh, of course, the problem. But uh, this is what that smokestack was producing, if you will. And uh, you might notice that um, I have a, the mediums, the mainstream press talks about carbon dioxide levels too. Well, that's mostly what we end up talking about. But if you put all the, all the greenhouse gases together, uh, you come up with higher amounts, unfortunately, that have that interaction with sunlight that excite the little molecules and move them around and create, generate heat. And so that's the name of the game there. So as you can see, the carbon dioxide levels, kind of back to that, because it's one solid measurement chemically. Um, the levels are the highest, of course, in three million years, and that's a long time before humans were around, for example. And uh, the temperature is responding, although not evenly, across the globe. January 2020 is uh, the 420th consecutive month in a row that has been above normal for the planet. So let's look back a few uh, thousand, hundred thousand years. This is the Vostok ice core <coughs> and, uh, in Antarctica. And so um, basically what we're seeing is a corresponding of carbon dioxide with temperature. And carbon dioxide, of course, is very much linked. It's basically a thermostat to our atmosphere's temperature. CO2, the highest in the last three million years. Um, of course, that's where we are right now. And you can kind of see just how, to whack, how out of whack things are, unfortunately. And um, the temperature has yet to really respond. This is uh, the latest um, Mauna Loa carbon dioxide uh, on the top of uh, Mauna Loa, the southern volcano on the Big Island of 
Hawaii, a pristine environment. And what you can see here, just to cover, is how where we are right in 2020, and how the averages are still going up. And unfortunately, um, they're not really stopping. They might even be getting a little more accelerated. Just how out of whack carbon dioxide is compared to what it's, it has been. How do they know about all this? Well, they can take the bubbles in the, um, in the uh, ice core samples, take those little bubbles and do incredible measurements on that to find out exactly what the atmospheric chemistry was thousands of years ago. And hence, they can reconstruct the temperatures. Sometimes they use proxies, but sometimes it's just straight right out of the, uh, the little bubbles out of the ice cores. Well, I had to lead that with this, unfortunately. So this is the course that we're on. And uh, you can see that uh, we have a few choices here. Um, of course, the best case scenario is the green line here. Uh, the middle ground is maybe the way we were kind of trending up through maybe uh, a, a decade ago or whatever. Um, and we're basically on that red line, unfortunately. And we're going for the highest amount to put the most at, uh, CO2 um, and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere as if it's some sort of race, as if it's some sort of apocalypse. And this is the response. This is the temperature. So what we have two lines here, you're looking at the, the land temperatures of all the continents as measured, and then you're looking at the ocean temperature notice the ocean temperature warms a little bit slower because it's like boiling a pot of water. Um, it takes a little while to boil that pot of water, so there's a lot of more energy. A lot more energy has to go into that to boil that, to get that going, uh, compared to the air temperature. So the air temperature of the land is really rising. You can see the, the uh, pretty steep curve. It's not 100% linear. It's not a straight line, but the averages come out to that. And uh, there's a lot of, of course, noise in the system, and that's what we call, you know, variation, uh, sort of natural uh, variation uh, that we see with El Nino and La Nina and other cycles throughout the uh, climate cycles throughout the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, the Atlantic, and so forth. So look back at 2019. This is the latest information, pretty much hot off the press. And 2019 was the second wettest year on record. In the United States, the temperatures were above average despite the regions that were among only uh, the only cool spots on the planet. And it's been true, and we're going to get into some of the relationships as to why. The interesting thing is that North America, and typically the parts of the United States generally east of the Rockies, have, for whatever reason, been the coldest temperatures over the last few years. Um, pretty much everywhere else in the world, it's been you know, right off to the races and very warm. So this is 2019 temperature, looking at the United States. Um, so you can see, interestingly, Vermont kind of averaged a little cool. Uh, of course, we had a very long winter. It was a very cold winter. Um, and uh, it kind of knocked the averages down. Otherwise, we would have been warmer than normal, like most of the, the country. What we have been noticing is a signal most recently is this, the southeast United States. You can see that at least in 2019, it's been pretty warm there. Out west and in the upper Midwest, the plains, the Rockies, that's where some of that colder air has been kind of displaced out of the Arctic. And that's kind of the connection. How wet was 2019? You can kind of see where the uh, little hot spots were. And there was some in Vermont. You can see in parts of the Northeast US. But uh, for the most part, it was the upper Midwest, the uh, lower Great Lakes, Ohio Valley, um, mid Mississippi Valley, and so forth. Remember about all the fields that were flooded back when we had that sort of stuck weather system in the spring, where we were really concerned about food and whether or not farmers could get their uh, you know, crops in and then grow anything. I think since then it's gotten better, but pretty uh, scary scenario. There was a lot of damage done early on. So this is uh, showing how wet we uh, are in Burlington on a local scale. For example, 2019, this is just pretty much hot off the press as well. And what we have is the, I'm sure a lot of folks remember 2011, especially around here. 2011, of course, was the year that Hurricane Irene hit us. But even prior to that, we had uh, training thunderstorms that were pretty amazing. I remember it well, it was May 27th. And it flooded like crazy in many, many locations in central Vermont. and. Uh, even in Burlington, though, that uh, reflection uh, showed up there in 2011 being the wettest. 
the drives, you know, uh, you can see there is 1894, and uh, we've been kind of in between on the average, but we're running still above average. And so 2019 was a little bit wet. And if you're, all you have to do is remember back to, I believe it was June, it was a pretty ugly month, and we had a ton of rain, and also in the fall prior to that. More U.S. downpours. This is not one inch, it's not two inches, it's three inches. Three inches in one day is usually going to get the job done for flash flooding. It depends on the um, antecedent conditions, the ground, how much soil moisture there is, how much saturation and whatnot. So let's say we just had a heavy wet soaker come through, we had another heavy wet soaker come through. Now you've got your ground is very saturated, so the next system that comes through is going to be obviously uh, even a more of a problem and it means it takes much less to get runoff and runoff is the name of the game especially in the Northeast United States more downpours you can see that we're kind of a hot spot 55 percent um, 90 percent out in the Pacific Northwest they're starting to see a little bit of an uptick uh, out there and kind of in between so far um, in the desert southwest and the southern plains and whatnot this is something that's interesting. Uh, uh, Climate Central had this. And it's the power of trees. And trees are a very, very good thing for climate change. Why? Because there's so much water vapor, there's so much rainfall coming down heavier, more intense. And the roots of trees is very, very important. Um, for example, you take the 1927 flood. We had a lot of rain with that, and the antecedent conditions ahead of that was uh, very, very moist and very wet, so we had high soil mo moisture, the runoff situation, whatnot. Um, but we had a lot of trees that were cut, of course, and Vermont was a lot less forested. Well, there's, that's a huge contribution to uh, runoff, and runoff is a, is a problem, of course, for us because much of our, our towns are all based along rivers. There are mill, mill towns and whatnot using the, the river as a source of energy. So a lot of our towns, a lot of our roads to get to our towns are right along the rivers. So this is an issue and it's going to be probably getting more and more um, notice um, because we're going to unfortunately see more and more flooding. Runoff avoided by trees, kind of interesting there. You take a look at the northeast United States, you can kind of see that. Also the Pacific Northwest up the California coast, coastal regions, sort of in the upper Midwest, uh, lower Great Lakes, and uh, down the, uh, looks like the uh, mid-Mississippi or southern Mississippi Valley, lower Mississippi Valley, and uh, a lot of trees. Where there's no trees, good luck. So back to warming now, and this is new data. We just turned to 2020, now we have new climatology, and we've got a full decade to go back on. Of course, not all the information's in right now, but uh, you can see for yourself that the 20 teens have been the <coughs> warmest, and temperatures are going up. We have to go back to the 2018 record. I don't have 2019, it's just not quite in. I think it comes out around the 15th of the month, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> So we're missing it just by one day, but you kind of get the picture here. Um, what, what it looked like last year was the fourth hottest year on record, significant in itself. Uh, of course, uh, even going back last year, they had incredibly warm Europe. You can see that they were pretty much uh, very, very warm. Um, the other thing you might notice is that just south of Greenland, there is a kind of a blue spot. That's a cold spot, and that cold spot is related to meltwater is coming off of Greenland that then that fresh meltwater sits over there and it doesn't sink and that kind of slows down the, uh, the uh, conveyor belt system otherwise related to the, to the Gulf Stream. And uh, that is another um, kind of a feedback that's taking place with the, with the Gulf Stream, with the, uh, the feedback of um, the oceans and the atmosphere. Lattice, the hottest years on, uh, on record globally, um, the last five. You can see where 2018 uh, ended up with. This is, uh, we're going to spend a little more time on this because it's how we know that carbon dioxide is affecting the atmosphere. So if you look at the um, top chart there, you can see solar plus volcanic natural. Let's say humans didn't exist. There was no cars. There was no coal being pulled out of the ground and then burned for uh, whatever reason. Um, you can see that that uh, observed temperature goes up and down. You see the natural variation. Uh, okay, so you can see the model temperature, and what the model temperature 
would do based on the conditions of volcanic ash, El Nino, several other sort of natural variations. And you can see how they separate there about 1960. Well, that blue line is what the where we should be if we didn't have greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that we put in. Instead, we have that line there on that top of, uh, top graph um, going up, and that is related to our changing climate. It's warming. Now, if you look at the bottom here, you can see how that matches very nicely. So, when you apply greenhouse gases through the technology, through all of the uh, various uh, ways of interpreting, computer modeling, you come out with these lines basically showing the observations, and then you can see obviously it matches up pretty good. And the models, the climate models, are, are really catching up and they're actually very, very good. But what the heck is going on? Is human caused climate change real? Okay, so global temperatures, um, what we have here is, um, we've already, first of all, the Paris Climate Accord was to try to keep everything under 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we've already hit 1.5 degrees Celsius in some spots. And that's mainly uh, back, uh, it's like, uh, this is in 2016, it was an extraordinary year. And probably what happened, if I remember correctly, 2015 was a pretty strong El Nino. When you have an El Nino, which is surface warming in the subtropical Pacific, you put natural variation of El Nino on top of climate-induced warming through greenhouse gases, you come up with this. But most of the energy is going into the oceans. And so we're seeing actually very little, very little of the energy that's creating the warming right now is actually happening in the atmosphere. It's mostly going into the oceans, which then interact with the atmosphere. So this is a think summer, <laughs> kind of an opposite situation to right now. Let's say we had a great snowy winter and it was fabulous and we had tons of snow and then it all melted and out in, I don't know, pick a date, a week after town meeting, maybe the perfect situation. And then we got through mud season really quick and now we start to have flowers coming up, green grass. We're headed into summer. Well, summers are getting hotter. Vermont is, it's as, as if Vermont has migrated to around Binghamton, New York. You see that? And then we have the highest emission scenario and the lowest emission scenario. And you can see how, if we continue on the course as business as usual, which we are, um, we're headed for, uh, I don't know, northeast, uh, either northwest Georgia or northeast, uh, what is that, Mississippi? Alabama, Alabama. They have great music in Alabama, and barbecue is supposed to be excellent. <laughs> Never been there myself, I gotta go. All right, so. Fastest warming seasons is not in the summer, though. It's the winter. What happened over the weekend? We broke records, right? 60 degrees, 60 to 65 generally. Crazy stuff. So climate change is really affecting our winters much more than our springs, our falls, or our summer. And that's kind of the, the name of the game. That's the trend. So getting back on a local scale, just to sort of measure that out back to winter, what we're looking at here is the Lake Champlain freeze updates through uh, 1816 through 2014. And note the diamonds. These are the little diamonds here. The diamonds, no reported freeze. So you can see the diamonds increased after 1944. We had more and more diamonds right up through 2008 and so forth. Obviously, it's a proxy showing the warming and how erratic or variable at least some parts of our winter is going to be to that formation or non-formation of ice. Uh, other changes we use for proxies um, can be our freeze dates. You can see that our growing season is getting longer because we're having warming temperatures, so we're getting an earlier spring and a later fall. Not always, and there are some curveballs I'm going to show you. Precipitation, the number of days uh, per year with uh, greater than just one inch falling at Burlington, for example. You can see how that's been hooking up, and that is definitely related to a couple things, water, higher water vapor, and the fact that we're getting um, weather patterns that are featuring heavier rainfall because of the uh, jet stream configuration, and that's related to the loss of Arctic sea ice. Occurrence of high flow in the Red River Valley. 
on the Mad River itself. Ten more days per year, and uh, th that is projected by 2100. The crazy thing I've been hearing in, in climate is that the new 2100 is actually like 2050. So the Earth's starting to catch up on its temperature. And this is, of course, uh, um, measured uh, the global land ocean temperature combination anomalies. The red is warm, the, the blue obviously cool. And you can see where we got. And I want to call your attention, it's very interesting. You see the little, so about 1940, you can see that little bit of a sort of uptick there and then a downtick. And it's kind of back and forth, natural variation, kind of the typical kind of thing. And then we really started to shoot up the ground right, right about 19. 75, 76, 77, 78, 80, right? Guess what happened then? We had the Clean Air Act that was passed, a great thing. It lowered the amount of smog, but it also took soot out of the air, and when you take the soot out of the air and you allow free sunlight to then interact with climate with the uh, global greenhouse gases, well, it excites those molecules and generates heat. Off to the races. So, oddly, yeah, if we had a more polluted atmosphere, that's what was masking that. Um, from 1950, you can see how the temperature warmed and then kind of industrial pollution. You can see how it basically uh, kind of took, what, 30, 30, 40 years? So, that period was because we had a particulate in the atmosphere that was reflecting back to sunlight. Take that particular out, particulate out, and what you end up having then is uh, free sunlight and a rising temperature due to carbon dioxide. So the temperature is starting to, to catch up, although not evenly around the globe, and it, it fits and starts. And you notice here the annual temperature anomalies um, are much warmer up at the top of the, uh, the uh, globe there in the Arctic. So what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. These are Arctic temperatures uh, for the records. Um, you notice that you start out with uh, you know, two is February and so forth. You see it, it all the way to December. So in the middle of the, the uh, um, June through August, uh, you see kind of a dip there. So the Arctic temperature record high, basically from 70 to 90 north latitude, way up there from 1950 to 1980 baseline. The comparison is that the temperatures have been going up in the Arctic during when? The winter. This is uh, today's shot that was just taken uh, from the uh, global of the uh, climate reality. And uh, I just want to call your attention. You can see that in the Arctic, how warm it is above normal. Right now we're into, uh, that looks like an, uh, a little bit of a negative AO or Arctic oscillation. But what it does is it displaces a lot of colder air south. And you can see there's uh, some blue there. Incidentally, that blue um, was 45 to 50 below zero around Alberta and British Columbia. And I was looking at it today. I'm going to be headed out there actually on Saturday. <laughs> and I was kind of hoping I'd hit the worst of the Arctic air, but unfortunately we're going to miss a little bit. But uh, that is some really cold air, and that's what's going to be here at the end of the week, my friends. Oh, so why is it being, you know, what's the deal? Why is the Arctic warm, uh, and the, you know, compared to average, right? Uh, versus the cold. Um, and look at how warm it is uh, on the eastern part of the North America. So why is that? Well, the jet stream is, is gone bonkers. It's slowed down. And that jet stream slowing down creates very large oscillations. And when you have that large oscillation, it takes the Arctic air that should be over the Arctic, displaces it to 45 north latitude where we live. So this is kind of the average temperature level in December, January, and February over the past 25 years. You can see that those averages show that they're above normal from the baseline. And notice where the cold air has settled. Settled into Siberia and parts of Asia, Eurasia. And then take a look at east of the Rockies into the United States, uh, Great Lakes. And we're kind of on the edge of that. That has been the climatological trend lately. Should be warming, right? What's up with that? It should be warming. Now remember, this is winter time. So during that time, we're actually seeing a signal. And this is very young science, very, because we haven't lost the Arctic sea ice since 1980, so we don't have a lot of great data sets. And there's a lot of controversy about this. Well, in fact, what is happening is that the warming of the Arctic 
is displacing that colder air as the jet stream is pushed further south, and hence, that's why we're having more extreme weather. So this is the Arctic again. You can see the ice cap. This was, uh, so far, the uh, 2012 was the minimum ice, sea ice extent. And uh, when you have open water like that, at that point in time, it takes a long time, that ocean water to warm up, melt that ice, you know, have the weather systems correct to uh, pull in warmer air from, from southern climes and whatnot into the Arctic, uh, starts to melt that ice, and that's what happened in 2012. We had the best of all conditions. We're very, very close to that right now. <clears throat> so what ends up happening is Sol will hit the ice, it reflects the albedo, okay? Uh, if you, I'm sure we've all seen this before, you want to melt snow a little faster, take some black particulate, throw it in the snow, it'll melt, right? So what ends up happening is, in a perfect situation in the Arctic, with a perfectly white and very strong albedo, that reflectivity would then reflect back out to uh, outer space. That's not happening now, because the ice is melting. And this, the sunlight goes in, the energy goes in that dark, dark water, and it heats it up quickly. How unusual is this? And that's 2012. You kind of get the picture, but that's kind of a short range picture. Let's look at even a longer range picture. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so here's where we are right now, 2020. So if you take the light blue line, which is 2019, it's on the bottom there. This is January through December, of the season. And you can see that the maximum ice in the Arctic is during when? February, late February, March. When do you think Mount Mansfield has its maximum snow? The snowpack builds up when? About the same time, right? Maybe a little bit later, elevation dependent. So then you go, when is it? When is our warmest time of the year? Well, typically for us, it's you know, June, July, August. A little bit offset there. It takes a little harder, a little more energy to heat the water. Uh, the Arctic Ocean. And so you see the dip, and then basically as we get colder, there should be more ice being made, right? So more ice is being made, but you can see that also that the ice is at some of its lowest um, lows. The, the sort of a fuzzy line here, the, the sort of solid uh, opaque line, uh, the gray line is where we should be, and that, those are two standard deviations. And uh, we're around three, four, maybe about four standard deviations. That's pretty significant. So near surface air temperature in the fall, you can see that in the mid latitudes. It's a little warmer lately. It's warmed up uh, after 1980. Again, that you know soot thing I was talking about. But you can also see that in the Arctic, it really jumped up. So when we consider a layer of the atmosphere stretching from here, that is, uh, say, the warmth of uh, the Bahamas, where it's as warm there or something, and then how the atmosphere is much thicker where it's warm. The atmosphere, the, when thunderstorms form, for example, you have um, uh, the atmosphere thickness is extreme. So you have tops of the thunderstorms that are sometimes 50, 60,000 feet. That's nothing unusual in the tropics. However, Back north, where it's much colder, the atmosphere is much thinner. So it doesn't take as much, uh, it's, it's just the, the thinness of the atmosphere is part of what is the, some of the physics around this. So what we have is an Arctic that's warming, right? Compared to down in the middle latitudes. So that yellow line kind of represents now, you can say maybe the blue line represents the older days. And consequently, high latitudes, are warming faster, and it's slowing down the jet stream. And it's been measured in basically in metrics showing this now. That OND, that's October, November, December, so that's the, the peak effect of the loss of Arctic sea ice. And what it's doing to the jet stream, the solar wind. And it does mimic, it's not 100% correlated, but it's pretty close. This is some of the work uh, produced by you know, Dr. Jennifer Francis and Steve Vargas, and uh, uh, she's from Rutgers, and he's from the like, University of Minnesota. And the came, paper came out in 2012 and enlightened everybody. And uh, there's been a lot of body of knowledge since then. But it's very controvers controversial. The reason it's controversial by other scientists is because simply there's not enough data set. 
We haven't had enough time to go, yeah, that looks right, because they want to be time, time data sets. Well, the Arctic sea ice has only just melted since about 1980 it started, and now we're off to the races. So the Roski theory here is a, the weaker westerly flow favors more meandering patterns, slower eastward wave propagation. So instead of having a jet stream that kind of circles the northern hemisphere, maybe a little short waves kind of go, you get these big giant undulations, all right? Kind of like rivers when they hit a, a flat spot. They have a tendency to meander. It's the same kind of fluid dynamics, air or water. So the effects of uh, AA is not alcoholic anonymous, but, but uh, Arctic amplification. Arctic amplification is what's going on in the Arctic. It's, it's warming at two, three times faster than the rest of the planet. And we saw that with some of those temperature scenarios. So it causes basically weaker westerly winds, a slower jet stream, and it intensifies uh, the troughs too, but mostly the ridges of higher pressure have a tendency to be expand. And so California, you think California with its uh, west coast uh, droughts and whatnot. Um, right now, of course, everybody's fresh in your mind as you think Australia, same kind of thing. Antarctica is doing the same thing now in the southern hemisphere as it's doing it in the northern hemisphere. It's been delayed a little bit. It was a little later start um, because Antarctica is a, a continent um, with, uh, with uh, land, with uh, a lot of uh, two-mile thick ice. And of course, Arctic, the Arctic Ocean is just an ice cap, and it's very thin in terms of comparatively. So as the high latitudes warm, middle latitudes, you get this sort of thing. And that's what we're seeing now. You see how those ridges are expanding further to the north? And that basically makes this. And this is why our weather's all screwy. So an example from um, uh, Jennifer Francis, um, basically showing a bridge along the west coast. Let's think of a, a kind of a, it's called a Pacific North American PNA plus. Uh, when it's negative, there's a lot of storms coming into California. So in this particular case, the jet stream would ride north and all the moisture from uh, really the Pacific would bridge up into uh, Alaska. And in uh, California, the west coast would be um, under drought conditions if that stayed there perennially. Nature's carbon tax. So that's kind of what we're getting right now. There's a budget of energy, there's a budget of carbon, and we're sort of undergoing that right now. But you can see that 2019 is uh, not the worst, but 2008 was uh, uh, from uh, 1980 to to uh, 2019, the year to date, that's the billion dollar disasters. You can see that we're not at the worst, but still pretty bad at this point. And of course, it does things like this and affects us here in Vermont. Selective uh, climate anomalies. Now, some of these I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through really quickly, but this is just for the month of January. They have the month of February, but they stopped. I hate to say it, but I think it's political. <laughs> it means the data, they're just kind of putting the clamp down on it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm suspicious. They should have had a, you know, March, April, May, June, July, right now, but they don't have it. So, one of the things I want to call attention to right here, you can see all these little red kind of ball things, that's uh, temperature records. Take a look at that across, uh, across the world. A lot of places seeing that. Antarctic sea ice extent, you can see, or Arctic sea ice extent up there in Greenland, Iceland area there and so forth. So keeping that in mind, of course, this is, in, this is January 2019. The top climate hazards um, as we head into 2050, 30 years from now, you can see that basically what we're looking at, our problems are precipitation. Our problems are probably a little bit more included in that would be severe weather uh, and erratic winters and maybe maybe very large blizzards, very large snowstorms that we haven't seen yet, the kind of snowstorms that might have infrastructure problems or barns collapse and this kind of thing. Think of the St. Valentine's Day storm, um, how much snow fell. 
We're seeing more of this across the planet. Why? Because there's more water vapor. Check that box. There's also screwy jet streams. And sometimes these jet streams cause much slower moving storms. And if that storm is unloading over you for a longer period of time, it's going to be more extreme. It's going to break more records. It's going to load. It's going to unload more water or snow. So we're going to go uh, month by month here, and just kind of this along here. So remember back. Um, this is uh, overall 2019, so I haven't gotten that point yet. But uh, California, the big, the big deal. Most the concentration, more or less in the uh, kind of the uh, middle part of the country, uh, east of the Rockies for the most part, but not so much in the northeast of the United States. We haven't really seen a lot of climate, really bad climate disasters here. Uh, it's been just a little to the west or a little to the south, major flooding, figure Iowa, the things that happened in, in the spring, for example, or think about the California wildfires compared to what we had here in Vermont. We complain about you know, 65 degree temperatures and a loss of snowpack. Of course, it ruins the economy, it makes us upset, but it doesn't burn your house down. Okay, this is the month of January. We're gonna kind of roll through these with that quickly. Um, you're gonna see a lot of these here. We got uh, 11 of them over here. And you might keep an eye on Alaska. Bearing sea ice extent, second lowest on record. Record warm temperatures along the west coast. Because of that, that's a feedback. Um, and then you're looking at craziness, okay? You're talking about record warmth and loss of sea ice. And then you go down to Arizona, snowy a single day on record in Flagstaff, Arizona. Hmm. Displacement, screwball jet streams, bizarre extra moisture, more to go into snowfall just because the temperature is below freezing. Warmest March on record for Alaska. Earliest 70 degree temperature on last time of record. Meanwhile, major winter storm, early March, over a foot of snow across Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. You see a pattern here? Katsubu had the warmest uh, April on record. Tanana and uh, Coastal Wind Rivers had their earliest ice breakout on record. And then you're looking at Seattle, April record 12 consecutive days of rainfall. Why? The jet stream got pushed south, picked up that Pacific moisture and pushed it in, right? So you see this kind of, a, you know, things are happening on the Arctic and the northern regions, and then there's a response down further in the lower 48 United States and down in Arctic, what's here? So we're into May, and uh, look at that, Alaska again, sixth one of May for Alaska. Part of Southwest Alaska, an extreme drop for the first time in more than 20 years. Uh, meanwhile, we're looking at record-setting heat wave in the south, southeast United States, uh, earliest 100 degree uh, day on record for many locations. In June, um, there's one for you. This is a little uh, anomalous, I guess. Uh, that is, uh, you can see that in the uh, Montana, Idaho here. One of the foot of snow fell across parts of northern and central Rockies on June 20th and the 22nd. Wow. But it's high elevation. Things can happen in high elevation. Still. And then uh, severe weather, flash flooding, June 20th, parts of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio, and Illinois, and so forth. Also keep your eyes on Hawaii, too. They've been having very ups and downs in terms of stuff going on over there. So, uh, for example, Hawaii. Sea surface temperature departure from average of both Hawaiian, across the Hawaiian region remains well above average for July. That's why some of those hurricanes that form off Mexico are now making it pretty much on a regular basis, either a little bit to the south of Hawaii or sometimes to the north and sometimes right over. So that's another issue that's a climate change relationship because of warmer sea surface temperatures. You got tropical storm Aaron uh, off the east coast there in North Carolina and so forth. And then uh, still looking at Alaska, second warmest summer on record for Alaska, and we'll find a drought, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see uh, the northeastern interior sections, and of course it contributes to what? Wildfires. So we're in September now. As I recall, September around here was about one of the more fabulous Septembers. Does everybody remember that? We had great weather in September, generally. So northeast, no problem. But look at the other places. 
significant winter storm that brought up to four feet of snow in blizzard conditions to part of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming during September 28th through the 30th. Any, anybody have an idea as to why? I'll tell you why. Because it was Arctic air that was to play southward. And again, it caused near 45 north latitude. We had more storms with that. Okay, we're in October, and uh, kind of just more of the same. Keeping your eyes on Alaska and also, let's see, Hawaii had uh, Kahului, or Honolulu, Lahui had uh, their warmest January through October on record. That's interesting because it takes a lot of energy to heat up the Pacific Ocean way out there off in the middle of the ocean, basically. Uh, so that's a significant deal to get that kind of energy to heat that to, to produce that kind of record. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. Let's see, we have, uh, this is November. And uh, remnants of Tropical Storm Raymond. We got Puerto Rico remained drought free during November. A small area of moderate drought emerged in early December. They had been getting really bad drought there. Of course, that followed the tremendous Hurricane Maria a couple years prior. Uh, poor Puerto Rico, they've been just, um, and then they get seismic activity, uh, you know, and, and earthquakes, and they're just getting all the ways. But uh, notice a uh, uh, strong low pressure system on the nor'easter off the east coast brought coastal flooding, beach erosion, North Carolina out of banks to New England, ice snow to the northeast. Uh, that was in November 17th and 19th. You know? Yes, our November was like our winter, and ever since then it turned. So this is mean temperature percentiles, and what we're looking at here is January to December, uh, the entire year of 2019 and so forth. Looking at uh, precip, that's what it looked like. So it was a water year for us. So some of these correlations are related to how warm the Arctic gets. So they went back and they did a study, and this, this is just one part of the study, but what it shows is Every time the polar, uh, the, the um, atmospheric cap, the polar cap we call it, the heights, um, it takes warmth to create those heights to rise, just as we were showing you that jet stream squirrely thing with the two lines and how it's been rising in the, in, because it's warming much faster in the Arctic. Well, that warming has uh, also been correlated with each one of these extreme weather events. Pretty amazing stuff. So there is some kind of correlation going on there. That's why what goes on up in the Arctic doesn't stay there. So here's some of the, uh, some of the um, emerging mechanisms. That's you know why is it getting cold in November? What is up with that? Well, Dr. Judah Cohen of uh, MIT um, uh, Atmospheric Environmental Research AER um, has been working over the last I would say. Oh, a decade and a half on trying his his whole thing is, is to try to predict the winter, long range prediction. And what he has discovered is that there are mechanisms that are related off of Siberia in the Arctic Ocean there, that when snow is is basically it's called the SAI, when Siberian A, I forgot what that means, it's an index. And what it means is basically when there's a lot of snow in Siberia during the month of October, if it happens fast, his winter prediction is that we're going to have a tough winter here in North America and some parts of Eurasia, etc. If that snow laid down in, during the month of October only is slow, we're going to have a warmer than normal winter. Well, this year it came out really on the edge 50-50. We kind of had that sort of thing going on in November. Now it's kind of a toast equal. We might be going back into a colder cycle now. So this emerging mechanism basically goes like this. AA is Arctic amplification, meaning a warm Arctic, okay? So you get earlier snowfall along the coast. This promotes a tropical lower pressure. That wave energy transfers to the stratosphere above the troposphere. So where our weather is basically located, where airplanes fly, even the high jet stream, that's all in the troposphere. You get above the tropopause, it's roughly, depending, it goes up and down, just like we talked about atmospheric thickness. Well, typically it's the, above the jet stream levels where the stratosphere is, okay? So that's the top or the ceiling of all the weather. So up in the stratosphere, we also have a thing called the polar vortex over the pole. And when energy is reflected from the ground through the troposphere into the stratosphere, 
it does this. Basically, the polar vortex is weakened. That's in the stratosphere. And then it weakens the polar vortex down below in the troposphere. It's like a boomerang effect. It takes about two weeks to a month. And you get a wavier jet stream. That wavier jet stream promotes a weaker polar vortex at the surface in the Arctic that releases all that cold air. And guess where that cold air goes? Through Alberta, east of the Rockies, the Canadian Rockies, the, and so forth. And right into, sometimes the upper Great Lakes, sometimes right into our neck of the woods. And typically when they get cold in the Great Lakes, we'll probably get cold too. And so that's, that's the mechanism that he discovered with his long range forecasting. Judah Cohen. Judah Cohen. He's brilliant. Okay, and that mechanism affected us last March. This is Lake Champlain. It looked landlocked. Remember I showed you all those diamonds about open ice? We got a new curveball going on. That new curveball means our winters may be actually getting colder. Shocking. What's this global warming thing? No, it's because of the global warming. So if you connect the dots, it basically is this, all that energy going to the ocean is melting ice. That causes energy that reflects up the stratosphere. That stress, energy in the stratosphere weakens the polar, the stratosphere polar vortex, which then boomerangs down, takes about two weeks to a month, weakens the polar vortex, releases all the cold air, which is now coming through Canada right now. I showed you Alberta. That's an example of it. And it's headed our way and it will be here late in the week. That is exactly what's been going on. And that's what happened in March 1st, which uh, there was no, uh, no ice, not all the ice right there. It was completely no open water on Lake Champlain. So Arctic amplification is alive and well. High latitudes are warming much faster than the mid latitudes, especially in fall and winter. Polar thickness gradient is weakening. You get zone mean flow at 500 millibars, which is about the cut halfway in the troposphere, if you will, at 18,000, 20,000 feet, uh, which is a kind of halfway point is what we use as a measurement. 500 hectopascals yeah. or millibars. It weakens the flow meanders more. Peaks of regions are elongated northward with the work for Jennifer Francis has done, Steve Harris. Uh, you're getting these up and down motions now, this sort of configuration of the jet stream that's kind of crazy. More amplified Rossi waves should progress eastward more slowly and increase the likelihood of blocking. When you get blocking, storms come to a halt. Uh-oh, what happens when a storm sits over you for days? Think Hurricane Harvey. See the connection? Weather conditions are more persistent. Let's say it's a ridge of higher pressure. That ridge of higher pressure is going to produce what? Drop. So, Unfortunately, greenhouse gases warming the atmosphere, messing with the configuration of the jet stream, is causing simultaneous droughts and simultaneous flooding, or simultaneous big, big snowstorms. Increased probability of extremes, cold spells, heat waves, flooding, prolonged snowfall, and drought. Uh, Greenland Ice Out 2019, this was this summer. You can see that uh, the 1981 to 2010 <coughs> Uh, with the, dot, the uh, dashed lines there, and then the 2019 melt percentage, you can see how uh, just extraordinarily lots of melt, lots of water runoff, right? That's what it looked like on the edges there. Uh, it was kind of melted back. And then again, this is January 1st to August 13th, and this is quite amazing because the greenhouse is a big, it's a big hotbed, really. I think I could consider it an island, but it's a, you know, it, uh, it is a, um, the number of melt days have gone up a lot, so much so that they actually have little tiny forests on the edges now of Greenland, and I think they've been there before, it's part of the oscillation of natural variation, but those forests, because of our screwball jet stream and blocking areas of higher pressure, have caused forest fires in Greenland and lots of runoff. Okay, back to a little bit more closer to home here. So, it's weird, it's, it's crazy to say this, but because of 
<laughs> climate change, we might be seeing bigger snowstorms. And actually, those years that we have the setup right, fabulous snowfall. Colder winter, fabulous snowfall. But our winters are not consistent. There's no persistence to them. There's these ups and downs. Again, that jet stream moves along eventually. Uh, the cutoff low gets kicked out. Uh, the next one tries to set up or whatever. And so there's a lot of variability. And so the name of the game with our winters is going to be variability. It's going to be one year is going to be totally different than the next, or say two in a row, this kind of thing. And this is the trend of what's going on. Again, what is it related to? The loss of sea ice. This is a little bit bad. Uh, okay, this is going back to the El Nino year, 2015, 2016. And uh, this is the, the top of Mount Mansfield, uh, the average uh, snowfall uh, at the stake. This is the snow depth, I should say, not snowfall. So what you're getting here is you're seeing, um, it was pretty low, but you can see how bad it, it, the season started out. Everybody remember that 2015, uh, how the winter started out, the winter 2015 was just disgusting. It was a very poor year for, for skiing and, and all that. This, on the other hand, was another year, 2018 through 2019. That was last winter. Look at the amount of snow at the state. Completely opposite. Variability. See that? Here's where we are as of today. The, uh, the, the, home, the green home there on the left, there, the mountain on the left, that's, of course, average snowfall. And then you can see uh, where we are as of uh, just a couple days ago, uh, the 12th. And we're not, we're not starting out too well. <laughs> and the reason for it is because of systems that look like this. You get these big oscillations. The big ridge of higher pressure pushes north. Downstream, it produces a uh, big tropical lower pressure. Sometimes it cuts off from the jet stream, and then you get that business. And this particular stuff you know, typically ejects uh, energy um, over the flat ridge, and that's also how we get ice storms. It's not a good setup for us. So, in general, this is uh, you might notice this is the uh, extreme weather events across the world caused more than $100 million worth of damage in 2019. But we can't do a carbon tax. <laughs> I find that really funny. <laughs> Notice it's the fires, 25 billion, California, October to November. 12.5 billion in the Midwest there. That was, uh, what was that? The uh, floods. Yeah, that was uh, in spring, March through June. <coughs> and then you got other various types of weather. And then in Asia, you're seeing the same thing. It's costing a lot. It ruins infrastructure. Magically, people think that oh, just a little warming, ah, we can't do anything about it. It's too, it's too costly. We can't do anything, it costs too much. Well, that's what's going on right now. What is the launch train, I would ask? What is the leaders? What are the politicians? What sort of logic train are they using? That's Mozambique, uh, tropical, or, I'm sorry, uh, tropical cyclone Ida. A lot of heat going on in, in uh, Australia. I'll get into a little bit of that here a little bit later on, but we're getting closer. So this is a, like paleoclimatology, past and current abrupt climate change. So the Permian-Triassic extinction 250 mil million years ago was uh, geologically instantaneous. And what they mean by that is that it happened very fast. It doesn't do this nice sort of curve and linear kind of thing, you know. It's like it, it goes along and all of a sudden it jolts. And it goes on again. That's called abrupt climate change. Lots of evidence in the paleoclimatology record that we're in for some big jumps. I'm going to go back to that because it was actually a little bit more. Um, okay, so the paleo Eocene thermal maximum, the initial temperature, that is the Siberian traps where the volcanic activity, for whatever reason, of continental um, uh, seismic activity, uh, lots, lots of volcanoes went off. And when the volcanoes went off, they were, uh, they put up a lot of CO2, and they raised the temperature. 
Okay, they raised the temperature five degrees Celsius, 56 million years ago. They may have been over less than uh, two decades uh, uh, in terms of the abrupt climate change that took place then. It caused, I think, the fifth mass extinction. Um, and then the additional rise of 2.5, uh, 2 to 5 degrees Celsius is projected over the next 80 years. That's according to the uh, IPCC, uh, back the latest data that came out in 2014. However, a much faster scenario is likely given trends and difficulties uh, to account feedback mechanisms, which I'm showing you one of uh, the Arctic ice and how it's screwing with the jet stream and creating colder winters, but on a variable scale. So, a globally accelerated climate change global warming event. We're waiting for one. Might be happening right now, might actually be happening with this last go around with all the fires in Australia. So, just to recap, we got sea ice extent down. That's the Arctic. We got Greenland ice mass loss. We got Antarctica also mimicking the Arctic now at pretty fast rates with mass loss as well. We got Alpine glacier ice mass loss. We got sea level rise going up. We got hurricanes that are slowing down and sitting over one particular island and just absolutely taking everything almost left, maybe the salt. That's Grandma. That was uh, Dorian. Everybody remembers Dorian. And uh, I don't want to get into this too much, but tropical cyclone behavior threat. This is if the world rises on average to two degrees Celsius. Remember, we're not there. In fact, the world right now, using climate reanalyzer, I saw it was about eight tenths of a degree above the uh, 1980 to 2010 baseline. So, uh, they figured these are the things that would happen, but they're already starting to happen at eight tenths of a degree Celsius. This is predicted to be a 2C. So this is uh, Mozambique, Cyclone Ida. And a reminder, abrupt climate change is one symptom of ecological overshoot. Abrupt climate change is, uh, these are the symptoms here, topsoil loss, natural resource depletion, ocean acidification, mass extinction, global toxi toxicity, toxicity, I should say, uh, chemical nuclear plastic pollution, growing social, economic inequalities, economic instability, political instability, rise of authoritarianism, not just around here, it's all over. Symptom cross feedbacks, and these, each one of these symptoms amplifies each other. Australia, look at their temperature rise, would you? A soy fire danger index. These are uh, the changes in fire weather index, or weather risk, I should say. And you can see that there are certain spots that are not doing too bad in the center there. I don't think anything grows. I think it's the, that's what the desert is. There's nothing to burn. And then on the other side of the scale, you have flooding. That was uh, the spring in, uh, I think it was Oklahoma. Climate solutions. There's actually a little bit of hope. It's amazing. I, you know, on a personal level, I'm very depressed. Any climate scientist, anybody dealing in my, in the work that I do, in meteorology on a day-to-day -day basis and in climate basis, is very, very sour. People aren't, you're, you're Cassandra, nobody listens, nobody wants to do anything, everything just continues to bumble right along as if you're just talking to the wind, you know? But there's actually some solutions now. The first solution, uh, and there's not a lot of data, this is all fairly young and fairly new, is iron filings in the ocean create mass plumes of phytoplankton. Those mass plumes of phytoplankton pull out more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than anything imaginable. Turns out, if they could mass produce some of this under the certain there's like, there are limitations, ecological limitations. The water temperatures have to be such and such and this and that. But under those situations, this is something that needs to be explored pronto. 
We don't have any leadership. We have to go around the leadership, our so-called leadership, which is not leading. So we have, need to uh, circumnavigate. Um, you know, people, businesses, people want to make money. We need money to be made in this sort of thing, too. Lots of money. This is the other new thing that we found recently, is that lo and behold, in Iceland, they, they started to capture carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and pump it deep into, in Iceland, in the volcanic um, chambers there. And lo and behold, they discovered it makes limestone. Well, guess what? There's companies that now can use that limestone to make cement. They don't have to mine limestone anymore. If we had this on a mass scale, pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, we could change things through these sort of technologies based on the mass scale. This is that one of those companies, it's called Blue Planet. And you can see the rings around this kind of thing. But that's actually carbon dioxide being pulled out of uh, the area around uh, San Francisco. So what this company has done is they they caused uh, they they worked with this uh, carbon dioxide sequestered aggregate they call it, and the last picture here on the right hand side is a taxiway that they built with that carbon dioxide pulled out of the air by this company on this taxiway in San Francisco International Airport. Pretty awesome, yeah. Why can't we repeat this on a mass scale? Where is the leadership? And that's what we have. And so what we got to do is we have to take that 500 parts per million right there. That's the problem. We got to push that down to 280. If we push that down to 280 with new technologies, I hate to say this, and you're going to think it's blasphemy. <laughs> you could pollute until you could have all the carbon dioxide, the oil, the coal, you could burn straight coal. As long as we pull it out of the atmosphere and keep it at 280 parts per million, we're good to go. Except that coal is very nasty and there's other side effects and we want to do that, obviously. We want green renewable energy. But you would think, you would think that the fossil fuel industry would be get behind some of this so they can continue their business model. You would think. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, I had a question about the Gulf Stream. Uh, some years ago, and I don't know if this may not be the case, but some years ago I read that with increasing ice melt, the ocean cools, it can slow down the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is what keeps Europe from reverting to the ice age. Is yep. there a concern? A lot further north latitude, yep. Yes? Yes, and so, yes, it is slowing down, and it is that fresh water melt that they, uh, interacting with the uh, thermal haline circulation, and it's the uh, Atlantic, multi decadal os no, that's another, hold on a second, AMOC. Atlantic, and we're overturning circulation, thank you. Okay, so that conveyor belt goes not just in the Atlantic though, it goes all over the place, all through near Antarctica, it, it, there's, it cuts all over the place. But they notice that there's two places that drives it. I think one of them is in the Southern Indian Ocean, very similar to the Atlantic, and then the North Atlantic. And the one in the North Atlantic is being slowed down because of the freshwater melt, the freshwater dump that's taking place right now off of, I showed you Greenland, I showed the ice melt. It's, it's messing with the, the, this whole conveyor belt. And when you slow this conveyor belt down, now you've got, you, heat wants to go north, okay? Um, cold wants to come south. And when you all of a sudden stop that kind of thing going on, you have massive disruption and, and massive climate change. Any questions? Um, uh, hi, hi, Roger. Hey. Yeah, good work. Good stuff. I mean, good stuff. Be bad stuff. 
Good way of presenting bad stuff. I don't know how to say it. Yes, <laughs> good bad stuff. Um, a lot of the geoengineering that you mentioned toward the end presumes that we have some breathing room. And that breathing room has been decreased with each half decade. So climate scientists were saying that the worst effects of climate change would be occurring about 2100, then narrowing that five years ago to 2050, narrowing that now to 2030. Yeah. And I just made a quick list of some other linked effects that I, we were talking at. One of them is because the Greenland Sea, the, the Greenland ice uh, sheet is melting so quickly, it's astounding like so in ways that no one could possibly have predicted, making people shake their heads in disbelief. That water is flowing on the west side of Greenland into the Labrador Sea. The surface temperature of the Labrador Sea, as you said, is much warmer. But what also happens is that as storms come off North America, as you've seen, they reach this somewhat warmer than normal sea surface off Labrador and Newfoundland, and they, they ramp up. They do what hurricanes do, only this is in the North Atlantic. So there are these enormous, heating, low-pressure systems which park themselves south of Iceland. Yep. And those low-pressure systems, like there's one going on uh, yesterday that was just devastating um, uh, Ireland with 16-meter waves and, and, and gusts up at 60 miles an hour, not called a hurricane, but with a low pressure at the center that was lower than any category one hurricanes. Oh, yes. Yeah, and, and, and this particular storm, like every other one like it, that has preceded it, because low pressure systems are counterclockwise, they rotate. And the warmer air from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, Portugal, Morocco, is pumped right into the Greenland interior. As a consequence, the Greenland interior spikes up during those storms two to three uh, degrees above normal center. And melts more ice. And, and melts even faster. So there's a thing that we get worth of tension. Yep. And then you have the um, overturning that has been absorbing the surface over uh, uh, heat that has been taking it down to the bottom of the ocean on our behalf, and on the human race's behalf for the last six decades. The bottom of the ocean has been a bank that has been storing heat that was generated the surface, and as a consequence, it kept our air much cooler than it would have been if this overturning didn't occur. I mentioned to uh, a major climate scientist in England last year that it seemed like the ocean had run out of room to store extra heat. And as a consequence, starting this year, the ocean's surface average temperature is now a degree centigrade higher than it was for the first time in human history. This surface heat, unlike air heat, is much more dramatic in its impact because, first of all, a lot of that ocean that is being warmed is further north, and the shallower parts of the Arctic Ocean above uh, Siberia in particular which were kept below the freezing point and actually below the freezing the tip point, point of methane. Uh, suddenly methane is being released in very large quantities from the Siberian Arctic. In Barrow, Alaska, at the methane center, it said there was an enormous spike that it never received before in January of this year. And it has been continuing to alarm people. And it is added to, as you said, to the CO2. You add the methane now because it's a significant gas, which it was not 40 years ago. Yeah, and the last thing is that um, the ocean, um, as, as, as a result of this, is acting less and less like an absorber of heat in many cases, the heat. So my basic question for you is, has, uh, from what you've read, I think you would read a different group of people necessarily, not necessarily the same people I do, how have the, the crossing points in terms of what geoengineering, how many years it would take to do that, versus what's changing uh, as far as the amount of time before the uh, atmosphere becomes untenably locked in FEMA? Well, I don't think we have a whole lot of time. Um, the thing that's very most concerning to me, by far away, and, and uh, 
There's a climate scientist, uh, his, his name's Paul Beckwith, I don't know if he's Dr. Beckwith, you follow him. And uh, he, he's, he's Arctic, like uh, that's why I, I like to watch the Arctic, because the Arctic is, is dry on a lot of stuff right now. The loss of ice up there is really, really driving my day-to-day -day job, because of the weather, I have to deal with the weather, uh, and, and weather hazards forecasting, and this sort of thing, and those are keeping me extremely busy. Um, the, getting back to the thing that's the most scariest is what we call a blue ocean event. Um, is when in September that sea ice melts out completely and then lingers maybe a month and then as the uh, season changes, the lower angle of sunlight will start to see more ice. And the next year, because of that first time around, that warmed up such and such, the next time it'll be now two months and then three months and then four or five, six months. And you're looking at what they call blue ocean events. And um, let's say it's over a period of uh, a decade to two decades that we see this sort of thing taking place. It's gonna happen, it's just around the corner. Well, you think our weather is crazy right now. And then there's a paper that just came out. And it's very scary. Papers basically equated that it would be worth 40% of all greenhouse gases the contribution of the lack of sea ice would be like adding 40% of all greenhouse gases since we started the Industrial Revolution. And if that's the case, it's sayonara. So that could be as early as 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I know this is gloom and doom, but I'd rather tell you folks. Yes, you had a question? Well, thank you, Roger, for all the facts. And, uh, <laughs> that, uh, so my question for you this morning is, is that there's a part of the human community that believes we're in the Anthropocene and believes that that's a good thing, that in some ways that um, it's almost a manifest destiny of us to get to this point, and that our technology will enable us to continue. So this is clearly the, universe, the uh, atmosphere is in it. It's going into entropy because we put too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it's not by accident. We've done this intentionally as a, as a as a human species. And um, so I think the discussion needs to be is what is our relationship. That you, the atmosphere is doing what it's doing because it's the atmosphere and we have no control over it. But what is it that we can do as a species besides the geoengineering, which is a band aid effect, to make some um, choices about lifestyle, sure. about economy, to, to, to mitigate that? Sure. So, I mean, you know, we want to do everything we can individually. You know, we want to drive less. We want to do all the things we can do individually. Recycle, you know, try to stay away from plastics, not do straws. On. But these folks, we have to really get real on this. These are nickel and dime things. We need massive, large, heavy-scale industries to change. If they don't change, all this stuff that we're doing is a joke. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say that, but it helps. It maybe makes us psychologically feel really good about ourselves. But if we don't get the pitchforks out and get some change going and some leadership, it, you know, everyone talks about existential threat. I'm looking at the threat, you know, around the corner here. Um, uh, you know, and, and everything that I'm seeing is on a daily basis. There's just more and more and more and more. If we could get, like I say, mass scale, what people make lots of money on doing that mass scale, since our, you know, this is a capitalistic system that is driven on, unfortunately, greed. I'm just gonna speak real here, okay? We're either gonna have to change that model, or we're gonna have to use greed to dig ourselves out of this hole. Anyone has any great ideas, you need to talk to people and get that out in the open. Is it possible to 
Say that one more time. Is it Um, 
Bangladesh is going to be flooded, and there's going to be a massive migration. The, I got to tell you, I attended a, I attended a, a Norwich University um, uh, symposium on climate, and I got to tell you, the military, they are on it. They have looked into it, and they are freaked out. Let me tell you why, just for an example. Uh, Norfolk Naval Base, all their wiring is under their dry docks, and all their wiring is made of stuff that will completely collapse. So they have to redo all of that because of sea level rise. And that was just one example. Um, I mean, the military is supposed to protect us, right? Instead of you know building things to kill people, why don't we attack climate change? Okay, we need to finish up. I saw fire. It's a documentary. And yes. It shows all over the world all of the uh, geoengineering that's being tried. So much, you know, it, it does start out, the documentary starts out with we're cooked. And then it, it goes around the world and it shows many, many people, many, many businesses, many people, many engineers working to sequester CO2. It's, it's really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. I mean, why we're not educating the, the some companies and these Money. Companies? Why are we not educating them and saying, hey guys, look over here? It's, I, okay. I was just going to say my last, you know, everybody says, oh, it's this climate, you know, the science of climate, it's all the scientists, this and that. It's really not that. It's, it's not the climatology or climate science. It's a psychological illness that is throughout this planet that puts greed and profit over life and sustainability. What the heck? What does that say? 